Sometimes I see something so moving, I know I'm not supposed to linger. See it and leave. If you stay too long, you wear out the wordless shock. Love it and trust it and leave. <laughs> It's that shit you love. You know, I really like cold brew coffee. I think that is the quickest way to get it directly into your veins in the morning. Also happens to be an excellent laxative for all of you constipated readers. Hope you guys are all doing well. I've been very, very, very busy. Very busy. Well, that's a lie. The book was just really long. Really, really long. That's like... That thing is about as thick as my face. I don't even know what that means. So, uh, yeah, today, Don DeLillo's... Don DeLillo's Underworld. Finally. I think plenty of people recommended this to me more than one. Certainly more than one along the life span of this channel. And I've had this book for, you know... <laughs> there's sun damage here. We can actually see the... Uh, the gradient of sun damage because of, uh, you know, the various windows that this thing has been sitting in. Don DeLillo is an American author who has written plenty of books that I have not read yet. This is actually the first that I've ever read, although I heard White Noise was also incredible, and that one came about a decade before this one. This one's 1996 or 7, somewhere around there. Like I said, this one's been sitting on my shelf staring at me for years. So about a week ago, I was like, come here, you son of a bitch. It's done. So Underworld, many would say, and I would agree, is a great American novel. What is a great American novel? When did they write them? Who wrote them? Where did they go? I can't answer the last one, of course, but I will try to describe it. I describe it as an enormous, pushing a thousand page meditation on life, love, sex, and death set in America. With themes, events, desires, and characters espousing views that are exclusive to this great whale of a nation. Don has written a story wherein the characters in this inari to unfashion all connect somewhere deep down. Another common theme of the great American novel. However obscure or mysteriously woven the thread, however complicated. The setting is all over, from the desert to New York to LA to Kazakhstan. And these stories forming this larger story take place over a good chunk of the 20th century, in this case from the early 50s to the 1990s. This is the first novel to successfully have made me give one iota of a damn about baseball, quintessential American sport, something I don't give a flying fuck about. But Don can make me give a fuck about it. You see, baseball is integral to the story, and it's with this very specific game that we open the book. Frank Sinatra is in attendance, and so is J. Edgar Hoover. And somewhere in here, wrapped up into this narrative, are, is all this foreshadowing of what is to come with the Cold War and the Soviet nuclear threat, with this overarching metaphor displayed as this very famous Renaissance painting, The Triumph of Death by Bruegel. It's great. But in its most basic form, Underworld is about a man named Nick, and a woman named Clara, and an affair, a very brief affair, that occurred between them a long, long time ago. They meet years later when they are very, very, very different people. And what better place to meet than in the middle of the sprawling American desert? What is it about the desert, American or any, any sort of desert, that encourages this type of reflection, like this sprawling blank canvas wherein the projections of your true feelings are finally free to leak out? to spread and collaborate with the landscape to form this atmosphere, something entirely indifferent and non-judgmental? Or could it be that it's simply much bigger than you? That often when you are thrown out of your societal environment into the desert, you gain a sense of just how old and indifferent to you it is. 
And sometimes that can be a beautiful moment and sometimes that can be a terrifying moment, but it's always, always attractive. It's a great moment when Clara is trying to explain to Nick how somewhere along all those lost years between them, life took a turn that left her feeling that it was somehow, and this is the word that she actually uses, fictitious. The ironic reality, of course, is that this is very realistic writing about fictional characters feeling fictitious in reality. Shit is an overarching theme in the novel, quite literally. Shit is Nick's business. Waste. The creation of waste. The discovery of waste. The discarding and management of waste. Emotional waste. Wasting away. The waste of war. The triumph of waste. And in the end, of course, the consumption of the beings that produced it. And although usually fascinating and well-written as Underworld is, by the end you are all too aware of the point of view this author possesses. And you won't be surprised that it is obviously one of heavy yearning and true human despair. Waste is a religious thing. We entomb contaminated waste with a sense of reverence and dread. It is necessary to respect what we discard. And another great paragraph here. Brian took a deep breath. He filled his lungs. This was the challenge he craved, the assault on his complacency and vague shame, to understand all this, to penetrate this secret. The mountain was here, unconcealed, but no one saw it or thought about it. No one knew it existed except the engineers and teamsters and local residents. A unique cultural deposit, 50 million tons by the time they top it off, carved and modeled, and no one talked about it, but the men and women who tried to manage it and he saw himself for the first time as a member of an esoteric order. They were adepts and seers, crafting the future. The city planners, the waste managers, the compost technicians, landscapers who would build hanging gardens here, make a park one day out of every kind of used and lost and eroded object of desire. This is this character looking at this mound of garbage being taken care of. Waste is death, right? From death comes life. This is where DeLillo got the name Underworld from Pluto, the god of death, right? Waste underground, hell, Hades, Tartarus, the underworld. Things you try to keep buried that resurface time and time again. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was really good, no question. But the last quarter of the book was a real struggle. I thought a lot of the interior monologues of the characters, a lot of that uh, insidey stuff was sort of sacrificed for exposition and kind of just like moving the plot points along and connecting all the dots, which was sort of, it wasn't nearly as interesting to me. All of it is preparing you for like the final 20th of the novel, right? This little section at the end where everything is like wrapped together and like, oh, okay. Admittedly, it's a great reveal of plot points, you know, and plot elements, but I mean, I think, I think we could have tied up X, Y, and Z and sacrificed about 300 pages, to be honest. Maybe the book would have been a little bit better. But, you know, it's, it's worth it by far. It's definitely worth it. I would read it again, and that is definitely saying something. I really value my time, and I have a lot of books to read. And I would read Underworld again. It's a good one. I'm paraphrasing here, but Knozgaard said something like, being a really sensitive person is usually very, very bad in almost all categories of real life, but if you're a writer, being a sensitive person is very, very good. And you get this impression from the first half of Underworld, which I loved. I really loved the first half. There were more dog-eared pages than not. You can, you can see, you know. Uh, and then it all kind of thins out right over there. So we start with a baseball game in October, on the 3rd of October, 1951, right? Dodgers versus Giants. With the shot heard round the world, which nobody thought was gonna happen. This is sort of a metaphor in itself and implies much more involving nuclear bombs later on. So you have J. Edgar, Jedgar Hoover, you know, Frank Sinatra, Jackie Gleason, and uh, all of these guys are in attendance. And this guy, Bobby Thompson, who's batting for the Giants, makes this impossible home run. And he wins them the National League pennant. Impossible, historically miraculous, you can watch it on YouTube. I don't really care about baseball. I know nothing about it. But when Don describes situations like thus, that doesn't really matter, and that's the beauty of literature. The difference comes when the ball is hit, then nothing is the same. The men are moving, coming out of their crouches, and everything submits to the pebble skip of the ball, to rotations and backspins and air streams. There are drag coefficients, there are trailing vortices, there are things that apply unrepeatable, muscle memory and pumping blood and jots of dust, the narrative that lives in the spaces of the official 
play by play. That's fantastic writing. The physical and the immaterial. Systems, physicality and animality. And the cold, inhuman. Certain doom. God is in the bomb. Numbers and calculations versus blood and muscle. Rationality against chaos. These are the subjects that all great writers are concerned with writing well about. And Don is one hell of a writer. So for all of you guys who are young or who are watching from Europe or South America or something and may not know about the history of the USA very much, I don't know much about it myself, but this is what I learned. J. Edgar, Jedgar Hoover, was the head of the FBI in the middle of the 20th century. He was widely believed to be an extremely corrupt individual who used illegal methods of gathering information as well as using blackmail against anybody or anyone that came in his way, including threatening the sitting presidents themselves. So in the beginning of this baseball game, while the crowd is going wild, somebody is tearing up this Life magazine or something and sending these little pieces of this magazine cascading through the crowd, these pages just fluttering and falling onto whomever they find. While he's meditating on this whole Soviet bomb crisis, J. Edgar Hoover is actually struck suddenly with this page that he brings off of his head and he looks down at it and it's this very famous painting by Bruegel he's never seen before, The Triumph of Death, and that's a magnificent passage worth reading the book for alone. And what is the connection between us and them? How many bundled links do we find in the neural labyrinth? It's not enough to hate your enemy. You have to understand how the two of you bring each other to deep completion. Again, this is a foreshadowing for the Cold War, a theme that is consistent throughout Underworld, a subject that immediately elicits feelings of hostility between nations, the Red Scare, and of course, mutually assured destruction. A reality that at this time America is not so slowly facing. And a reality that you and I absolutely face right here, right now. So a kid grabs the very ball that Thompson hits into the crowd, right? He grabs the ball and we follow him. We follow the ball, which his father takes and sells for like 32 bucks. And then we follow the, ball, the ball's tra trajectory throughout these different hands these obsessive collectors, and so on and so forth. We always have our eye on the ball. Along the way, we're introduced to our main guy, Nick Shea, and his brother, Maddie, a chess prodigy, Maddie's teacher, Albert, and Albert's wife, Clara, whom Nick has an affair with. Nick's present wife, Marianne, in the 90s, is also having an affair with Nick's friend. Are you confused already? I was. It helps to go into like the Wikipedia page and just kind of like look up the characters and make sure you got all the names right because there's like 10 of them or something and you know you're just like, oh, okay, okay. It can kind of wander from here to there in some passages with this comedian Lenny Bruce coming in, he, the guy who overdosed on heroin way back in the days in, in LA, but um, more, you know, the, he, he's, uh, he's brought in for his, you know, his kind of um, comedic treatment of the fear of the Cuban Missile Crisis at the time. And uh, then there's also this character, Sister Edgar, this nun, whose crisis of faith at the end of the book, stemming from this tragic crime, is the stuff writers sell their soul to Satan to be able to conjure. It's a great, great narrative. Her narrative might have been one of the most interesting to me, uh, maybe my favorite. The threats of nuclear destruction permeating the atmosphere all throughout these eras from the years of 1950 to the 1990s, it's still there, it's still, it didn't go anywhere. This murderous new technology, again, the human and the technological and the consumption of humanity by the technological or through the technological, it's a major theme. Everything and everyone is haunted by it. These things in the background, and we are haunted by several characters whose stories don't really end so much as just sort of continue. Even though they may be dead, they're still there, so not really. Just floating out of the corner of your eye. One of them is Nick's father, who was supposedly murdered by some mob guys way back when, when he went out to get a pack of Lucky Strikes and just never really came back. Another is a serial killer who shoots people in their cars on the highway with perfect aim. They may be gone, but not really, not quite. Just like the threat of war, it may simmer down, but it never really leaves you. It's always there, lurking, waiting. Remember what I was saying about trying to keep things down that eventually always resurface? According to David Foster Wallace, who is still the most recommended author to me on this channel, 
DeLillo is the greatest living American author. For those of you who have been watching for a while and know that I do not care for Wallace's stuff, his neuroticism and obsessions are neither interesting nor attractive to me. And in order for there to be some sort of desire to read the book, I have to, in some way, in some capacity, be attracted to that particular brand, their particular flavor, their particular style of, let's face it, completely unhealthy and of unnerving obsession, which is what makes great literature, period. I'm already too old to spend a thousand pages with somebody whom I genuinely don't like who's trying to get me to like them on every fucking page. I'm going to leave that for the wet cement minds of the young and insecure. Not that I am not one of them, but I am comfortable with not liking something that everybody else loves. And that's just not the case for many people. I left Underworld in Whole Foods for about four hours, which was great. The big joke, of course, was that, you know, I actually did go and went exactly back to the spot, found it, and nobody had touched it. My friend, you know, laughed about it and he said, oh, it's too heavy, which is true, you know, to some degree. That's the joke. Nobody picked it up or even probably gave it a, a thought, you know, nobody even skimmed through it. And this is, to some degree, this is something that worries me. The idea of life being too short for big or challenging novels. I think that's an enormous issue. This desire to comfortably stay inside of the minds of the authors that we know. You see, that's the flip side and the reason I did read Infinite Jest. I did read Infinite Jest all the way through, every single goddamn footnote. But that's the issue with big books. You need to sit with them for a while before you can make a decision. This is the flip side. And while admittedly I was taken with DeLillo pretty quickly, there were parts, plenty of parts, where I was like, damn, man, let's just slow going. But it's worth it. It was totally worth it. Those quiet moments of nuanced sensitivity in this novel are really what I live for. And what do I mean by that? I mean the descriptions of internal processes and subtleties within characters regarding certain things, thoughts, moments, or relationships that can only come from someone who is truly sensitive and takes their time thinking about things that have not been described to death already. Hopefully that haven't been described in literature at all. I like Don because I agree with him and because I trust him. Because I can relate to many of these things that he writes. Plainly put, when he writes something that fits the description above, more often than not I am inclined to believe that it is true, either because I have felt it, that is, I have experienced directly what he is trying to communicate through his writing, or even more interesting, he's convinced me that this is what it really feels like. You don't have to experience everything an author writes to be convinced that he or she knows what they're talking about. This is the beautiful lie that is often used to tell the truth. And it's the most exciting thing about literature for me. Because if you're good enough, you can convince people of anything. Very dangerous indeed. There is something about videotape, isn't there, in this particular kind of serial crime. This is a crime designed for random taping and immediate playing. You sit there and wonder if this kind of crime became more possible when the means of taping an event and playing it immediately, without a neutral interval, without a neutral interval, a balancing space and time became widely available. Taping and playing intensifies and compresses the event. It dangles a need to do it again. You sit there thinking that the serial murder has found its medium or vice versa, an act of shadowy technology, of compressed time and repeated images, stark and glory and unremarkable. This is a reference to a tape filmed by a very young girl that accidentally catches this murder by the serial killer uh, on the highway. This little girl's filming out this car with this driver and he waves at her and then he gets shot. And uh, So, you know, obviously that's all a reference to that, you know, little eight millimeter um, clip of Kennedy getting shot in the head, which you can watch everywhere now. Uh, very disturbing video and uh, anybody getting killed on tape is obviously disturbing and there's this great you know meditation on technology mortality murder you know that all that stuff is great this guy this character is he keeps playing this tape for his wife he keeps making her watch it almost aggressively and he doesn't know why and that's a that's a little piece from that scene and at one point the actual serial killer calls in live on television just to clarify some things that he thinks that uh, the media are getting wrong and this character we follow is actually watching the television as it's happening. That's a great moment. Very interesting moment. The killer is using this voice scrambler on the other end and he's just setting the record straight. It's 
very, very bizarre. This is great writing. It's disturbing. And not only for the time, but it totally anticipates what's happening right now. Snuff films from ISIS that looks like they have studio backing from Paramount. And it's all real, man. And readily available for you to watch at your fingertips while taking breaks from your Czechoslovakian bondage porn in the next Google tab. The modern age is something to be feared and admired. The weight of the modern age is something the characters feel. Generally, they feel the weight of aging. Pure and simple, of attaining goals, and then realizing that the best parts were when they were not financially secure, but rather when they just really did not give a fuck. And they yearn for that. And they'll never have it again. You can't get it back. Conspiracy and mistrust of the government are very common themes in DeLillo's writing. After JFK was shot, the illusion of the mythos, you know, the great American government was, it disintegrated. It was revealed to be just that, an illusion. Even more so after the corruption behind JFK was revealed. And that was a turning point that led us through the Vietnam War, several other wars, all these wars, and then this one right now, which is, leaves us where we are, which is anybody's fucking guess. To the conclusion that we are in fact governed by something that really overall just does not give a fuck about us. What it gives a fuck about is being the thing that governs us. And that's it. Finally, I'm going to give you my favorite description in the whole book. The cheesecake was smooth and lush with the personality of a warm and well-to-do uncle who knows a hundred dirty jokes and will die of sexual exertions in the arms of his mistress. Each writer is his own language, DeLillo said. Life's too damn short to read bullshit. Consider not flying to and from or throughout Europe for a little while, guys. If you can, be safe out there. Much love to everybody. More on the way. Subscribe. Almost at 10,000. Drink some coffee. Talk to you guys soon. Take care, y'all. Ciao.